I want you to look at the scripture. If you grab the scripture sheet beside you, or if you, you can just watch on uh, PowerPoint, or again, open your Bibles or your device to uh, Genesis chapter 25. And uh, Genesis 25, we're going to be read, begin reading verse 24, a portion of the scripture we actually read last week, but we're still going to, to bring us into the context where we're going to go ahead and begin at verse 24 and work our way down through verse 34. And if you weren't here last week, we've started a series that we're calling uh, Losing Myself, and it's a story of Jacob. And uh, if that, that series title concerns you a little bit, let me just give you, uh, you could also name this series title, not only Losing Myself, you could name it Finding Myself. And so whatever, whichever one makes you feel better, you go ahead and take it, that'll be fine, because we hope both of those things happen somewhere in the series if it hasn't already happened in your life. So begin at verse 24. It says, when the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. It's kind of freaky, don't you think? Does that sound normal to you? It didn't sound very normal to me when I'm reading through there. But um, So it's kind of, kind of a... You know, we talked about it last time. He's kind of like the, the, the icon for all hairy men. So they named him Esau. And that had more to do with him being red than hairy. But anyway, after this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. We talked about that some last week and what that means. So they named him Jacob, which means heel grabber. It means uh, supplanter. It means uh, deceiver. Um, I wouldn't rec recommend, I mean, Jacob doesn't mean that to us today. We've got some Jacobs, I meet people Jacob named Jacob, we view that as a high honor today, but at that time, it really was, uh, depicting some things about him wasn't all that cool. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Get it? He was content. Anyway, um, yeah, someone will get that later on today and uh, go, that was bad, but, you know, or not. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebecca loved Jacob. Boy, that looks like a recipe for disaster, doesn't it, uh, in a family unit? Um, once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished famished. That's a very important word for what we're going to talk about today. And he said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. And that's why he's also called Edom. Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is a birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread, some lentil soup, stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. I don't know how that hit you, but that, that actually, that last phrase there makes me feel kind of sad. Just something about it that he would despise his birthright. And we'll talk a little bit about what all that, what all that means. Uh, but it meant a lot. It was a big deal. I mean, there was a reason why Jacob wanted that birthright. There's a you know, reason why he spent his life always grasping, trying to get to the front of the line. There's a reason. It wasn't without any reason at all. It wasn't just something he was just... Uh, um, just looking for something to do, there was a significant reason why he wanted that. Now, I'm hoping in the series, I'm hoping even today that uh, we will begin learning to let go of who we think we're supposed to be so we can become who we really were intended to be all along. There's, there's an aspect of selfishness that we're going to talk about today, and it's called impulsivity impulsivity. I just need to tell you the disease of impulsivity is a bad disease and it will serve you horribly. And there are many, many people who have suffered greatly because of this 
impulsivity that occurs within one's life. See, at first read this story, and there's been sometimes I think as a kid and sometimes even as an adult, and I've read this story, and it almost sounds too silly. It almost sounds trite. It, al- it almost sounds like, oh, yeah, right. I mean, what's a, he, he gave his birthright for, for a bowl of soup. You're kidding. It's just almost like a joke. Like, who would do that? But in deeper thought, what I begin to realize is that all of us do this, have done it. It happens all the time. That this is not so far-fetched and not such a silly story as to say, well, that was just crazy, just two crazy brothers, and this happened, and no big deal. No, it's a really big deal. And it's a really big deal not only for these guys, but it's a really big deal for you and for me. Um, in fact, I'm, I've titled this message, It's a Bad Deal. It's a really, really bad deal. And what I want to tell you is that, that, that Jacob and Esau are not the only ones, or Esau's not the only one who cut a bad deal, and, and, it, and it made a huge difference in his life. Every, every person here has cut a bad deal in some way or another, and, and we've all made some bad deals. And what I'm really here today to do is to kind of call out a little bit of a call and say, stop making bad deals. Stop selling yourself short. Stop selling your future on the altar of the immediate. Stop making bad deals. And so I would say in the history of mankind, this seems like it must be one of the worst negotiations that has ever occurred. I mean, I, I mean, as, I'm, as I've mentioned in the bulletin at least, I, I think there could even have been a child standing there. A child would have said, whoa, wait a minute, time out Esau. You're making a very, very foolish mistake. See, Esau's birthright meant he would get double the inheritance when Isaac passed away. And here's what you have to know. Isaac was loaded. This is a man who was wealthy. And you might say, well, you know, my parents died in debt. I just inherited debt from them. It's not no big deal. This, this doesn't matter to me. Um, let me just say this. This does matter, and I won't be able to really maybe convince you of that until a little bit later in the message, but I want you to hang with it. Even if you're saying in your mind, well, I don't have any big birthright on the line. I don't have some big uh, inheritance on the line. What does all this have to do with me? If you, I, if you hang with me, I promise it does have to do with you. You know, we could, we could almost title this message, you got to be kidding. you just got to be kidding. It, it's so egregious that you just almost can't believe it. You can say, come on, man, what are you thinking? And, and it's a bad trade. And so because of this and because of our tendency to make some bad trades, personally, I'm going to give you three warnings. And so if you look, there's on your sheet, you don't have to fill anything in on that. We uh, went ahead and did that for you. All you have to do is take whatever notes you, know, you feel like you want to write down, okay? And so the first one is this, of the three warnings. The first one is beware of mistaking growth for maturity. Beware of mistaking growth for maturity. If you look back at verse 27, it says the boys grew up. And in the process of growing up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. And so we see these boys, they grew up. In fact, at the time this happened, you, you, they're acting like a couple five-year-olds in their interaction, but, it, but, but they actually are in their 60s when this interchange took place. And you know, I believe... We see it all the time. In fact, something that is kind of almost a lifelong uh, uh, process for me, since I shouldn't say lifelong, but as probably about the last 12 years, um, is, is this, this process that I've called uh, the bridges to maturity. And it's something that I'm still working on. I, I'm working on it on a regular basis. I visit it. Sometimes you'll hear me preach aspects of it because you, if you remember the seven aspects of life that I refer to on a fairly frequent basis in messages, our emotional life, our spiritual life, our financial life, our health, uh, you know, there's seven areas 
that, that, that we speak about on a regular basis because it's the stuff of life. It's kind of the comprehensive angle of who we are and what we're about. And here's what, we're, here, here's what I've observed in my study of this in my own life and other people's lives is we'll tend to have some areas in our life where we really do mature. We really do grow up. But we'll have two or three areas back here that are lagging far behind. And we're extremely immature in those areas. And as a result, that immaturity keeps tripping us up, even though in one sense we're very mature in these other areas. That immaturity keeps coming along and tripping us and undermining uh, exactly who we are. You know, I, I, I don't know about you, but we all have our kind of our ways of responding to things that, that uh, maybe offend us or, you know, cause us to feel like we were disrespected in some way. And so let's just say that someone spoke to me in a, in a demeaning kind of way. You know what? There's something that naturally inside of me that wants to say, talking to me like that? I'm a grown man. I'm a grown man. And talking to a grown man like that? Now see, right in the midst of feeling that or wanting to say that, there's a juvenile aspect to that process. Here's what I want to say. I'll say this to myself and anybody else. If you're a grown man, just act like a grown man. You saying you're a grown man doesn't make you a grown man any more than the fact, any more than you really are. Being a grown man is living like a grown man, acting like a grown man, taking responsibilities, taking the hits of a grown man. Just because we're grown physically doesn't mean we're grown up inside. Doesn't mean that everything has come along at the same level. And so Esau got really good at what he did. But it seems like he didn't do so well at growing up in who he was. He was the firstborn. He had a birthright. And, and, and so he ended up forfeiting everything that he had even though he was really good at what he did. He was a great hunter. And so while he grew in his skill, he never grew in his character. He didn't value the things that he should value. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't put it, it in the high place certain things that should have been in a high place in his life. He demeaned things of importance. And let me just say, this can happen to us, and especially if we're gifted in a given area. Because that giftedness allows us to believe that we are mature. We're all grown up. It allows us to think we're, we're, we're good. We're good enough. And, that, and, and it shields us sometimes from that Achilles heel of the areas in which in our life where we really are very immature. He be, verse 27 says he became a skillful hunter. If you look at it, the boys grew up, he saw him became a skillful hunter, man of the open country. He was skillful at what he did. He got really good at killing his dinner. But listen to this. He never got good at controlling his appetite. Now, do you see that? I'm, I, you know, I, I know we're talking about food here, him getting food and all that, but can you see the correlation to every area of our life? We get really good at this one area of our life, but we have this other area where we have extreme weakness going on. And that extreme weakness will oftentimes overpower the strength and bring us down in ways we never suspected. And so he got really good at killing his dinner. He got good at, the, he was good hunter. His dad loved him because he loved game. He loved cook game. And so his dad liked the idea he could go out and get the trophy buck. He could go out. His dad really liked that. He really, he, he was excited about that. His dad loved him really more than Jacob because of his skillfulness and his ability to bring home the bacon. Do you know men, I'll just say for men, men sometimes, and, and it happens in our world today with women too, you get really good at bringing home the bacon and think that's what makes you a man. But he never got good at controlling his appetite. And when we don't get good at controlling our appetite, it will eat away at the foundation of our lives. So don't mistake growth for maturity. Don't mistake age for wisdom. Have you ever learned a big lesson from your kids before? You go, I, could, I can't believe what I just learned, just what they said. Just, I, that what they just said taught me something so important, 
So we learn lessons from even little kids. We can learn lessons from anybody. The question is, is it so much what our age is? The question is, what have we invested ourselves in the development of, our, of who we are? Don't mistake growth for maturity or age for wisdom. See, Isaac loved his son for his trophies. Look at verse 28. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. He was a mommy's boy, and Esau was a daddy's boy. And verse 29, he comes in, and he says, he sees him cooking his stew, Jacob cooking his stew. He's a good cook. Esau came in from the open country. He says, he was famished. He was famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. I'm famished. Now, here's a couple things I want to say is, be careful about letting yourself get famished. You know, and staying on the food topic here, even though you, you please read below the line on this. Read down to the whole depth of everything being talked about here. Food's on the table, but we're really talking about something, the interior of who we are. Have you ever gone to a grocery store? Hungry? Isn't it funny what you'll come home with? You know, have you ever said to your spouse, hey, let's eat before we go to the grocery store? Or, you know, let, let, I mean, let's not go hungry. Because you go hungry, you're going to come home with all kinds of stuff. You're going, why did we get that? We just looked good in the moment. We really wasn't part of our routine or whatever. But, man, it just looked good. And your grocery bill, you had to go out and get a loan to finish it off, you know. It's like, it's like um, and so, so, I mean, Vanjie used to send me all the time for errands to the grocery store. I notice she doesn't do that very much anymore. And it's because I guess I always went hungry. I always came home with like, you know, with way more than she ever asked for. She goes, did, did I ask for that? I'm going, no, but I like that. I like that. That looks good. And that looks good. So, you know, you have to watch who you, um, who you send in the grocery store and when it's the timing. Because if they're going there hungry, man, you never know what they'll come out with. When you're famished spiritually, when you're famished emotionally, when you're famished relationally, you are up for grabs for some things that can really rock your world in the big picture of it. So you've got to make sure that you're not allowing yourself to become famished. And if you do become famished, you need to be really careful who you expose that famishedness to. I know that's a new word, but anyway, I threw it in. Because if you tell the wrong person, they might take advantage of you. Now understand that Isaac, his boys, Jacob and Esau, these guys never seem to be on the same page. You, you know, we don't ever have any kind of big harmony moment here where we see these, these twins just hanging out in love and harmony and all that. It seems like there's always this contest from the very beginning. They were jostling even in their mother's womb. They're always kind of at odds with each other. And he comes in in the susceptible state speaking to his brother who does not have his best interests at heart, lays out exactly where he is emotionally and gets taken full advantage of in that moment. I'm not saying Esau is clear on this at all. I'm not saying this is all Jacob's fault. Esau made the decision. He was the one who was willing to do it. But the reality is he trusted the wrong person with his vulnerabilities. And I, I just a word to the wise here is this. Make sure who you make yourself vulnerable to. It's, it's, and you go, well, I, I, I don't trust anybody. Well, I, I think some people are trustworthy. If you don't trust anybody, that's a problem too. You need to be able to trust some people, but some people don't even think about it. They just share their vulnerabilities with everybody, and they'll be taken advantage of in a heartbeat. I remember um, when I was... I don't remember if I was uh, doing my internship or whether I was already on staff at this church, but it was the same place. And the pastor there, as I've talked about him many times, he's, he's spoken here years ago, he's a little sawed off guy, and sometimes about as big around as he was tall, and he was just a bundle of fun and bundle of joy. Very sanguine, very outgoing. He just, he, you know, he, you met, if he walked in here today, he walked up, you would, he would talk to you like he'd known you his whole life. He'd go, hey, Doc, how you doing? Oh, it's so good to see you. You'd be going like, well, who, who are you? He just, he couldn't help himself. At first I thought he was fake. And then I found out this, that's really who he is. He can't even help himself. And so we were, we were purchasing a, a bus for the church. And, um, 
And, and, and so we had a dollar amount in mind and, you know, and approved what we could spend, what we do. And now I'm the kind of, I like dickering about buying vehicles and stuff. That's kind of like down my alley. And so I have that brain on. I'm young, but I still had that brain on. Mac has his, hey, everybody's great brain on, you know? Hey, how you doing? He's walking around, hey, the salespeople. And the salespeople take us out and they show us his bus and he and the guy said, well, I think our budget was $6,000. And uh, he said, uh, the guy said, he said, well, how much is that? And he goes, 10000 He goes, Matt goes, just almost without even any reaction. He goes, wow, that's a good deal. I'm like, whoa, I need to put a bag over this guy's head. I know he's the boss, but, man, this is not going to work. And so I finally got him aside from the guy. I go, man, Mac, now how can you negotiate? You just told him it's a good deal. He goes, ah, oh, man. He says, well, you go ahead and negotiate. Whatever. I, don't remember, I don't remember what we ended up at. I, don't, I just remember when he did I'm going, it's over. You just told the man, it's a great deal. You just, he thinks you're going to buy it for $10,000. We don't have a chance of coming down from it. And so, you know, you have to be careful who you tell everything to. You need to have somebody you tell everything to, but not necessarily everybody. Now, again, we have people in our Celebrate Recovery who have gone the route, Mike's one of those, and a few others who have gone the route going, you know what, because it helps other people, I'll go ahead and tell everything. But that's not everybody's calling. And, that, and, and, and what that does do, it just goes ahead, you know, in a, if you want to live that way, it's not a bad way to live because, well, people can speak ill if they want to you, but, you know, your junk's all hanging out here, so there it is. You can take your pick what you want to criticize about. It's all out there. But, but, but the Bible never tells us we have to do that or that's the way it has to be. But what it, is, what it does say is we do need to confess our sins to one another. So, but, but, but be wise. You have to be wise who you share your vulnerability with. Make, make sure that you at least have an awareness of who you're talking to. Now look at this, verse 30. Verse 30, he's, he comes in, he's famished, I'm famished. Verse 31, Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. And, uh, and, and, and notice, notice, what he, notice what he says there. He goes, quick, let me have some of that red stew. Quick, I'm famished. And Jacob, seeing all this vulnerability, he says, hey, first sell me your birthright. And then verse 32, he says, look, I'm about to die. Esau said, I'm about to die. What good is a birthright to me? He goes from this big, hairy man to this little drama queen. Oh, I'm about ready to die. I'm about ready to die. You know, I'm kind of looking at this from a standpoint of thinking somewhat logically, and I'm going, man, you are the big, bad, hairy dude. Why don't you just smack him, give him a big smack, take the stew, Bump the birthright. I mean, you can't, you can't, you know, no, nah, I'm so weak. I can't do anything. I can't, you know, I'm not saying that would have been the right thing to do, but I'm just looking at it and going, you know, these guys didn't love each other very much anyway. It was kind of a thin love at best. And so here, here he is, but he's so vulnerable. And you know what? You can be as strong as an ox. You can be a person who's really you know, like this big hairy monster. You can be tough. You can be all that. But I will tell you this. Whenever we hit certain vulnerabilities, it will make us weak as water. And I know water can be strong, but that's, you know the expression. Weak as can be. And in that weakness... We can, we can talk ourselves into all kinds of things. And he's saying just out loud, he goes, look, I'm about ready to die. What gets a birthright to me anyway? I'm going to die anyway. At least I have a soup. I live till tomorrow. Wow. Wow. Let me give you number two. Beware of unsatisfied appetites that become exaggerated emotions. Beware of unsatisfied appetites that become exaggerated emotions. I, I, I'm hoping, I, I, I really feel like that what we're sharing here with you today, these, especially these three major points, they're really not the kind of thing to wad up, throw away, and forget about. Not because I'm sharing this message with you, but because... I believe at the core 
of many of the problems that you and I face in our lives, we ignore these truths at the core. You know, I, I, we, we typically, from, from kind of the stage here, we typically give you, you know, the five reasons why you ought to do this and it's important and it kind of come from a very positive angle. And, 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 and sometimes warnings don't sound all that positive, but I'm just going to have to tell you, it's still coming from a very positive angle, but it's still a warning, a warning. And the warning is that if you allow unsatisfied appetites to become exaggerated emotions, you don't know what you will do. You really don't know what you will do. So beware that you don't get too hungry. And I'm not, again, remember, please filter this down into the important stuff of life. This is talking about all the, all the main areas of life, not just talking about hungry uh, physically, because, you know, you guys are going to get to satisfy that in pretty soon here anyway, and uh, um, if I keep moving anyway. Um, see, but when, ha- when you go around hungry, you'll reach for the first thing that you think will give you a hit. When you get real hungry and you go to the refrigerator, you hear that voice calling out to you, and you open the refrigerator, you know, you probably aren't going to immediately think, well, I'm, real, I'm starving. I need to grab me some Brussels sprouts here, you know? You're going to probably reach in there and grab some Briar's ice cream or something, you know? And go, that'll, that'll tide me over to get some real food in here. You know, just something to kind of, kind of get, you, get you going. And I would like to say beware of the quick fix that is available in your times of hunger. Remember... We keep talking, keep saying this, and I want to say it because food's only an analogy here. I mean, it might apply in some cases, certainly. But, I, but, but I'm really talking to you about your heart. I'm really talking to you about your spiritual condition. I'm really talking to you about your soul, a part of you that will live forever. And see, one of the reasons that we make bad deals with life, with people, is because we make bad compromises with our character. We, 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 we just get too hungry. We, we may be feeding that hunger with the wrong things. We may, be, we may be, but we get too hungry, we get famished. We let ourselves get in that famished point, and we get in that famished point, then all of a sudden, our unsatisfied appetites become exaggerated emotions, and we'll act on and do things that we would never do if we were in our rational minds or if in a point of fully being committed to the Lord. You know, and we can kind of smile and smirk a little bit at the bad deal that Esau made here. But I think we can all relate how our emotions can exaggerate and cause us to be emotional, not just have emotions, but to be emotional. And when we're emotional, we'll oftentimes do things we would not do Otherwise, what are some of the hunger things? You know, we can, sometimes people think, well, I'm never going to get married, so I'll just settle for this. You know, some people think, well, I'm, I, I'm never, I'm never going to be wealthy, so I'll just settle for debt. I, I, I'm, I'm never going to be able to survive until the right person comes along. So I'll just settle for this lifestyle, this whatever. Can I just tell you that for as many emotions, for as many as many needs, as many aspects of your life that you can be pulled away in, that Satan has a bowl there for it. He has a bowl he'll give you in exchange. He has a bowl. And I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna just say to you today, whatever it is that's calling out your name, that's, that's reaching out to you, because I, I would have to say within a group even of this size right here, that there are those that, that, that their hearts are being, your hearts are being pulled in a direction. Your hearts are being pulled towards something or away from something that's good for you. And, and there's a bowl being offered to you. And I'm here today in this moment of sharing to warn you, please do not take the bowl. Walk away from the bowl. Beware of the bowl. What, 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 what does the bowl represent? It bowl represents satisfying the immediate and the altar of the future. And, and taking, taking what, what, you, what you 
what you really don't want, but you're willing to settle for it because it satisfies in the moment. And, and, and so you accept that, but you're not left with much. Beware of the bull. It's a bad deal. A bull that would separate, would, 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 you would take and sell your birthright. What a bad deal. Bean stew for your birthright. When your life is empty, you'll let people fill your bowl with almost anything. Can I say that again? When your life is empty, you'll let people fill your bowl with almost anything. It's a possibility even some here today have been trading your birthright for a bowl. And we're going to talk about what do we do about that. But first of all, let's kind of finish the story. Just think about this for a moment. What if Esau had a buddy who had a friend who walked in there with him and kind of heard him talking? He's getting famished. Give me that bowl of soup. Give me that, give me that bowl of bean soup, bean stew. Give it to me, please. And then here's the deal going on. You hear the exchange Jacob was making for it, and you hear the silly talk that Esau's giving. And the friend would go, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, Esau. Please, I beg you, don't sell your birthright for that bowl. Don't do it. Listen, let's go find your mom. I know you're not her favorite, but she'll still probably cook you some food. Let's go get, let's, I'll cook you something. Come on, don't sell your birthright for that. And, 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 and so to have somebody along, but in that moment, he's by himself. Sure, he's with his brother. The brother's reaching out to take, take advantage of him. And I just want to say to you today, if you don't have that friend, get that friend. If, you don't, if you're here today and you feel like you're being sucked away toward a bowl that you know isn't the right thing for you to do, please let me be that friend to you. Let somebody here be that friend to you to stand in the gap for you and to say, no, do not take that bowl. That bowl will not serve you well. Please let us, let us reason together, so to speak. Walk away from the bowl. After Esau ate the beans, look at verse 33. Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Verse 34, then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some little stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. I try to be very kosher about everything I say publicly. Sometimes I fail. This might be one of those times but I have to ask you this question. What happened to the bean stew after you saw ate it? Where did it go? Don't answer me, please. I think you know. Where did it end up? Where did they end up? And the reason we know that's the, that's the case because it seems like he ate, drank, got up in a hurry and left. You know, it already hit him. Now, I, I don't know, but I want to tell you this. What we do know, it leaves you hanging, okay? It doesn't, it doesn't serve you well. It serves you for a moment. Serves you for a moment. A birthright is for a lifetime. Changes everything. And I want to just say number three is, and possibly the most important point out of the three Beware of the temptation to give up what you want most. I mentioned it last week for what you want now. Beware of the temptation to give up what you want most for what you want now. You might, I've heard stories like this personally over the years. You know, I'd like to stay around and raise my kids, but, well, they don't say it quite like this, but this is the essence of it. But she looks really hot. You know, I'd like to stay around and raise my kids, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look out for myself now. Birthrights for bulls. Birthrights for bulls. We, 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 we would give up our purity for something that satisfies for just a brief time. Give up our legacy. Be willing to give up the impact of our lives be willing to give up the power that God wants to work in us. It's a bad deal, folks. 
it's a bad deal. Whatever you're being tempted to give up for a bowl of beans, see the bowl of beans for what it is. Understand it's not worth it. Walk away. Run. Do whatever you have to do. Find a person who will walk with you, who will stand with you. And I think there's a possibility some of you right now are even saying, you know, this is interesting and all that, but it's not relevant to me because I, I don't really have a birthright. Let me take you there for a moment, because if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you do have a birthright. We have an inheritance. In fact, it says in your notes, the rest of them are, I think that I'll share on the back side. But First Peter chapter 1 and verse 4 says this, 3 and 4. It says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in his great mercy has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance, you hear that word, that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you. Through the redemption of Jesus Christ, we have been given an inheritance. We're going to talk about that. We're going to wrap this up. So you have an inheritance as a child of God. There are things that God has set apart. He's saying nothing can corrupt this, nothing can spoil it. It is reserved for you. The devil can't take it. Do you know the devil cannot take your inheritance away? You can give it to him if you want to. Esau gave you up. You can give it to him, but he can't take it away. John 14 Verse 27 says this, and if you look at the back of your notes, you will see this. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Let not your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. What does God say he gives us? He gives some of what we have right now. One of it is he wants to give us his peace. And you know what? What sometimes we do is we settle for bowls of anything but his peace. He, 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 the Bible says he's given us joy. I mean, the, the fruits of the Spirit, we could go through all of them. I'm just going to mention two or three of them. He's given us joy. doesn't mean that we're going to get joy when we get to heaven. He's given us joy now. It's a fruit of his Spirit. It's in you. It's one of the things that you inherited as a follower of Jesus Christ. But you know what we spend our time doing sometimes? Accepting the bowl of grumbling. We, 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 we suck on grouchy soup. Or we, 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 we eat sulky soup. And so instead of receiving the gift of God's joy into our lives, we grovel in the bowl of grumbling. He's given us a testimony. I want you to look with me at verse 15 of chapter 5 of Matthew. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Do you know God's given every person here a testimony? If you're a follower of Christ, you have a testimony. And you know what we tend to do? We tend to sometimes hide that testimony. He says, don't, don't put it under a bowl. You know, put it up on a candlestick. Let it shine. Don't cover it up. Don't, don't, don't let something hide that testimony God's given you. Don't lose your testimony for a bowl. You know, one, one of the things that I've struggled with sometimes in my testimony has been anger. And I, you know, I'm not, I'm, I can't say, and I think being about I'm not an angry person at the house. I'm not, you know, beating on everybody. And that kind of, I don't mean that. But I do have a couple spots where it seems like something will trigger an anger spot for me. And some of you know, one of the weaknesses is whenever those boys with little lights pull me over. I don't understand it. I don't know altogether about it. And God's working on me and I'm doing better. And I'll tell you, I'll give you a recent example of how I did better. But, but back a few years ago, I had a state trooper pull me over in heavy traffic. I knew I wasn't speeding. I knew I, I was sure I wasn't doing anything wrong. He pulled me over and he told me the reason he pulled me over is because I didn't have a seatbelt on. Well, I'm sitting there very righteously indignant because it was happy hour. So I proceeded to tell him, why don't you do a breathalyzer on me and then why don't you stop 10 more cars out there and do a breathalyzer. You'll find out you got the wrong guy and blah, blah, blah. And I'm telling him this stuff. He said, do you know who you're talking to? I said, well, I don't know you personally, but he goes, well, look on my shoulder. I said, I can't see your shoulder because you're facing me. So he turned like that. And it said, Georgia State Trooper on it and nothing else. 
I said, I thought you were going to show me some stripes or something, buddy. You had something to show. No, you go, Rod, you didn't. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. And then you know what he said? He said, do you want to do it the easy way or the hard way? And at that moment, somehow I got control of my anger and said, let's do it the easy way. <laughs> and so he gave me a ticket for my speeding belt, which turned out to be a $15 ticket that I wasted a lot of my time and his time else by being angry about. But I will tell you this. I also got pulled over by a Georgia State Trooper a few weeks ago because I was going over the speed limit. I was doing my best to stay under the speed limit. Not under it, but, you know, in the range. I had a very good communication with that man. Now listen to me. No, listen to me. That was the smartest state trooper I've ever met in my life. He just looked at me and said, buddy, slow it down and hope you, hope you have a good trip. That was, he was why. He was, but you know what? I didn't lose my temper with him either. I didn't try to tell him stuff I shouldn't have been saying either. And you know, can you just imagine after I got a hold of myself, after the sleeve situation and said and that man said to me excuse me sir what do you do for a living <laughs> what do you think i would have said i can promise you i'd have been tempted to lie but i wouldn't have i would have told him the truth but i would have been tempted to lie so that tells you something immediately doesn't it i wasn't doing i, w I wasn't wearing my testimony well and you know it's amazing what will let steal our testimony away and 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 it's a bad deal and and being led by our senses instead of the spirit and I, I want to wrap up with this if you look at hebrews chapter 12 verses 15 17 see to it that no one falls short of the grace of god and no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many see that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like who can you imagine? Because sometimes you're like, well, he just sold his birthright. No, the Bible says in the New Testament, the godless. The, guy, the writer is writing saying, godless like who? Oh, Esau. He was godless. Who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. We could conclude right here and say this. Beware of the bull. It's a bad deal, but I do want to conclude with one other thought. There was a story of two sons in the New Testament. There is a story, two sons. It's very famous. It's Luke chapter 15, and it's called the prodigal son. One, this guy, he sold his birthright too. And he went and he had beans, of, he had gourmet beans, he had jelly gourmet beans. I mean, he had them all. He had all the beans you could. But one day, the beans ran out. And can I just say this to us all? They always do. The beans will run out. They ran out fast for Esau. Some people keep having beans for a lengthy period of time, so they think they're getting by with the beans. But I need to tell you, someday the beans will run out. Because they always do. The prodigal came to himself and he says, you know what? Look at verse 15, 17 of Luke 15. When he came to himself. And let me tell you something. You almost always have to come to yourself before you can come to God. Because until you come to the end of yourself, until you come to realize who you are, where you are, what you're doing, until you come to that place, you often not even think that you need God. He came to himself and said, how many of my father's hired servants have enough bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? So he got up. Some people say, well, God will meet you halfway. Can I just beg to differ with that? This is no halfway deal with God. When he saw his son coming, when the father saw his son coming, he ran to meet him. God will come to where you are. If you're headed toward him, he won't meet you halfway. He just comes and gets you. He came and got that son who was headed home. And he was so excited. He was so happy to see the son that he said, let's just kill the fatted cow. And it was, I understand it was grain fed, not grain fed, or it was, uh, it was organic, whatever it was. Anyway, but anyway, kill a cow, get him a robe, give him a ring. He was dead and he's now alive. He was lost and he's now found. He got it all back. He got the ring on his finger, got the robe on himself. He got this big party. And in that moment, think for just a moment, there's a bit of oddity. Esau lost everything. And he went in and cried and begged. He couldn't get it back. 
And the prodigal son seems to get it all back. And then we have to remember there was another son who was a firstborn. In Romans 8, 29, it says, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And he's the son who didn't sell his birthright. When he was in the wilderness, hungry, fasting for 40 days, and Satan said, prove who you are by making that rock become a stone. Jesus said, I am the living bread. And he didn't take the bowl. He went to the cross. He didn't take the bowl when he was in the garden. And he said, if there's any way this cup could pass. He didn't take the bowl. He went, he went to the cross. He went to the tomb, but he rose again and gives us all the promise that we can have the inheritance that God has promised us. He'll give you your birthright back because we all lost our birthright. We all settled for something. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have had our face in a bowl of beans somewhere along the way. All of us have come short of his glory. And Jesus says, I didn't. And since I'm the big brother, I'm going to transfer the rights to you too. I'm going to let you in this.